Good evening. We are so glad that you were able to join us this Wednesday night in July. First, uh, the first time that I've been had a chance to speak in quite a while. So I'm glad that you have taken the time this evening to to join in with us. Um, I was just asked recently to speak and. And it just happened to come at the time that I was doing a, a big Bible study for myself. And so it's just kind of worked out well. So thank you for being here once again. Um, so I'm going to start off with a story. I recently heard this and I felt like it just, it just went well. There was two gentlemen. One was named Adoniram and the other one was named Jacob. They went to college together and they were roommates. While they were roommates, they decided that they were deists. Deists are people who are, um, they believe that there is God, that they believe that God is in the universe, but he is not going to actively be involved in our lives or be involved in what's going on in the world. So these two gentlemen, early on in college, decided to be deists. After they got out of college and they were doing some traveling, separate, they had gone their separate ways, Adrenayim, had been traveling, and this was before trains, planes, and automobiles, and so he was on his horse. And while he was on his horse, he was traveling for a long day and had gotten to an inn. And while he got to that inn and looked for a room, they told him, of course, there was no room in the inn. So he begged for a room. He said, I'll sleep in the lobby. I'll sleep anywhere you'll let me sleep. Just please give me a room. Well, they told him, look, we do have one room. This one room is next to, is, has two rooms attached. But in the other room, there's a gentleman there who is dying. And he is dying, and is in la he's loud, he's in a lot of pain, um, he's, he's writhing in pain and, and yelling out there at times. Adoniram um, said, I'll take it. He said, I'll be able to sleep through it, it should be okay. Well, throughout that night, Adoniram, he heard this man screaming. While he heard this man scream, he began to wonder, is this man going to go to heaven? Will he go to hell? What will happen to him at the end of his life? As he began to think that, he chastised himself because he realized, according to his own beliefs, God doesn't become involved in these lives. And so he just wondered, why am I thinking this? So he put it behind, his, behind him and laid there, but still listened to the man dying. Overnight, the man got quiet, seemed to get quieter for him. In the morning, Adrenayim woke up, went to the innkeeper's front desk and went to check out. And he asked him, what happened to the person that was in that room dying, in, in pain? And the innkeeper told him, the man died. The man died in the night. At that point, they began to talk a little bit and <clears throat> the innkeeper began to share some more information about the person in that room. He said, well, he was a younger man about your age. Kind of piqued Adrenayim's interest. And he goes, well, what about him was, was, you know, tell me more about him. And he goes, well, he had gone to a university in the New England states. And he told him the name of the college, and it just so happened to be the same college that Adrenayim had attended. Adrenayim then said, well, what's his name? Maybe I've heard of him. And of course, if you haven't guessed already, the man's name was Jacob. Adrenayim had laid in a room next to his friend's room and heard his friend scream in pain and die throughout the night and never went next door to see how he could help. He even wondered about the man's eternity, but because he didn't believe, because he wasn't concerned about it, his friend died alone. As Adrenayim, that later that morning left, and he was shaken, of course, he began to think, why didn't I go next door? And if I believe or I even thought about this, and I think maybe this man couldn't go to heaven or didn't go to heaven or, or anything of those thoughts, maybe there, there is a God. And so later on, a little later on, he converted back to Christianity. And his thoughts were about his friend Jacob. What happened to Jacob? And he doesn't know. He didn't know. Later on in life, Adrenayim became a missionary. In fact, he, he was the first person to uh, take the Bible and put it into the Burmese language and spent his life there. Him and his family's life was there. And I thought about this and I thought, this man who deep down knew the right answers, who knew what was going on, 
stood in a room next door to a man that had lost hope. And Adoniram had that hope for him and never took it to him. And that, that story has stuck with me. And I've wondered about it. I've wondered how much like that are we in our life. So tonight I'm going to talk about a man after his own heart. Not God's heart. Not anybody else's but his own heart. If you're like me, you've probably found yourself over the last few months being inundated with political opinions, political attitudes. Anything that goes on in this world is politicized, no matter how tragic it's politicized, no matter how trivial it's politicized. You see things happening to other people, whether by their choice or other people's decisions, and you begin to wear on you. It begins to wear on me, and I become weary of it. And so I had chosen to just kind of pull away from it, which is okay, because I needed to focus on what was going on in my world. But a strange thing began to happen. As that happened, I began to think, I need to take care of my family and do what's best for them, which is what God has called me to do, which is okay. But then at that point, I went to another spot in life, and I realized I was going to take care of me and mine first. And as much as I want to take care of my family and take care of my children and make sure that they are okay, I began to look at other people who may not be able to as someone who would encroach on our, on our personal lives, someone who may take from us, someone who may need something that they should have done for themselves. And all of a sudden, although we wouldn't frame it this way, those people began to look as if they were an enemy, as an enemy that might hurt, might harm, in some way, not even physically, but I was prepared to push them away if they got near. And <clears throat> knowing that God has called us to, in Mark, go out and preach the gospel, to go out and love on people, to go out and take care of people, I became the opposite of that, or I was becoming the opposite of that. Maybe you find yourselves in that same spot. And, and the worst part of it is I don't even have any animosity toward anybody. I have no ill will toward people. There's not a group of people, whether it's their beliefs or their class or their status or whatever, there's no group of people that I have truly ill will that have harmed me. There's no singular person that I can tell you, I don't like them because of what they believe. I can't stand them. I want to, nothing, There's, I, don't, I don't have a certain person that I know their name that I feel that way toward. So for me to begin to feel like people are an enemy almost was wrong. Over the past three weeks, I have um, been doing a personal Bible study in the book of Jonah. While I was in the book of Jonah, I wanted to give it its due diligence, but let's be honest, it's a minor prophet and it's only four chapters long. So. How much is there, right? I mean, it's a big fish. People are saved. Jonah gets thrown in the water. A couple things happen. That's the, that's, that's the extent of the story. I've listened to multiple Bible studies. I've read things about Jonah. Um, a couple things normally happen. And we, like I said, we talk about the fish. We talk about the, the plant that grew that provided shade and that God had allowed to grow and God killed it. And Jonah got mad about that. And then we move on. To the other, to the next minor prophet. And both of those things are great stories and we can glean from them. I assume that these would be the two things I would hear about, grow about, and, and that would be it. But for me, it was not until I got to chapter four that I really realized what was going on with Judah. It wasn't until I got to chapter four, knowing um, that, I, was, that I, I began to realize who, who Jonah had become in his life. And not because he was a um, wonderful man, but because he was after his own heart. He was actually more selfish than I realized, and he was actually hardened in heart to a degree that I had never realized before. So in chapters one through three, I'll just do a quick, a quick one there. We don't really get to see the full picture of why Jonah didn't go to Nineveh, at least in the first three chapters. So he just ran. Besides them being wicked, what's wrong with Nineveh? Well, what's wrong with Nineveh is they were part of Assyria. What's wrong with Assyria? Well, they had been, there had been generation after generation um, of conflict between Israel and Assyria. 
they had been aggressive toward Israel. They had held them as slaves, and, and there had just been a lot of war between those, fraction, those two countries. There was no love lost between Israel and Assyria. Um, so Jonah had no love for the Ninevites. Uh, and I don't mean they were, he didn't like them because like, they, they were Democrats or Republicans. He didn't like them because they were Cowboy fans. He didn't like them because they didn't cheer for the Cubs. We're told in Jonah 1 that they were wicked. And when it says wicked, we're not talking about just a little, little bad. They had gotten God's attention for their wickedness. So this was well beyond anything that we could imagine. So here's a quick rundown of the, of the events. Jonah, prophet of God, is told to go warn the people of Nineveh and tell them to turn from their wicked ways. Jonah goes the opposite way and takes a ship to Tarshish. A storm hits and threatens to capsize the ship. The others on the ship are terrified when Jonah sees and while Jonah sleeps soundly in the bottom of the boat because he was not on going to Nineveh. He had pushed that aside. The other ask him why he's sleeping so well, and he tells them. He even tells them to throw him overboard because he is the reason for the storm. These people do everything they can to not throw him overboard. Have you ever noticed that in Jonah, he knew what needed to be done he knew that he was the cause of the problem, and yet he expected others to do what was necessary. Side note, he expected others to take the responsibility for what he had done. He is the cause of the problem, knows the answer to the problem, and still expects the others to, to make the hard decision. He finally gets thrown overboard. A big fish comes and gulps him down. At this time, while in the belly of the fish, he decides to pray. Another side note. We don't see him pray in the ship. We don't see him while he's walking the plank, praying. We don't see him calling on God until the big fish gulps him and the seaweed's wrapped around his, his throat. So the seaweed's wrapped around his throat. There's no way out. There's no other choice. So he cries to God. Does that sound familiar? Have we ever done that? I've done that. I created a problem. I said, God, help me, but only because I couldn't figure anything else out. So we see this as a great miracle of saving Jonah. And I've wondered how many fewer miracles we might have to see in life if we listen to God for the first time. How many fewer trying times would we go through? How many, trying times, how many fewer trying times would we experience if we had just listened to God sooner and followed what he told us to do? So anyway, Jonah agrees to go to Nineveh. How big of him to finally tell God, I'll listen and go. God, you've done all of this for me. So quick recap, chapter one, Jonah says no. Jonah gets thrown in the water. Chapter two, in the belly of the fish, he says I'll go. And chapter three, the great thing that happens, people's lives are changed. The Ninevites turn away. Right there is a great story, full of excitement, intrigue, danger, the good guy wins kind of story. But after all that, after all the things that we see God has done, all the things that we, Jonah has seen God do, he hasn't changed. So let's read what happens. Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And it says, But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. That's Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. So first, let's make a list of what we don't see. What we don't see is Jonah rejoicing at the beginning of chapter 4, at the end of chapter 3. What we don't see is him staying with the people and, and having a celebration over the changing of lives. What we don't see is him staying around and as a prophet of God, 
offering guidance to the king of Nineveh and to all the people and to the leaders. What we don't see is him staying with them and being with them. What we do see, though, is him leaving, him griping, him complaining. He pouts, and he goes to set to see what will happen. I can almost imagine when I think about Jonah going over, setting down. He pitches a tent there. He sits in the shade, and he watches to see if the people will really change. Are they really going to change? Are they really going to be like what they said? Did God save them needlessly? Did God, did God save them? But you know what? They're going to turn back to their wicked ways real soon. I'm just going to sit here and watch, silently hoping all along that God destroys them. He even tells God, I knew it. I knew you'd show compassion and grace. I knew it. I knew you'd be a, I knew that you would stand with these people. And then he goes, I'd stand, I can't stand to see who these people live. So I'd rather die than be associated with these people. I'd rather die than be associated with these people. So what do we end up with here? We end up with a man full of anger, hatred, and vindictiveness. He personally condemns an entire city, over 100,000 people in this city, and he condemns them. His hate took him to a point of turning his back on God and ignoring God. His hatred, his vindictiveness, his anger took him to a point to disobey and then to put others' lives at risk. When we go back to the storm, those people's lives were at risk because of his decision. And then when he knew the fix, his anger, his hatred, his disobedience put these lives at danger because he still refused to make the right decision and a willingness and an unwillingness to fully repent once he saw what had happened. His hatred was so deep. Now, yes, he had gone through a lot. He had experienced hurt and pain and probably seen many of his friends and family experience the same thing. But the thing we don't see is his realization of how great God is. In here, in here he knew it. He had experienced it himself, but he couldn't stand to see this group of people experience it. So what else do we end up with here? We end up with a man who knew who God was and what he was about. He tells him, he calls God gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who chose to relent from sending calamity. And this is where we chose, this is where we discover why Jonah chose to flee, because of the attributes of God. He says, I said this at home. So we see that when before he even left, before he even got on the boat to Jaffa, before he, he left to go to Tarshish, we see that he had told God, this is what you're going to do. He goes, I said this at home. I told you I knew you were going to do this, and that's why I chose to flee. I chose to flee because I knew you'd be gracious and compassionate, God. I knew you'd be slow to anger. I knew you would abound in love. I knew you were a God that relent from sending that calamity because I've experienced it, and I've seen you do it before. And because I've seen you do it before, I knew you'd do it to these people who don't deserve it. We see a man who was selfish. He was more worried about himself over others. He was concerned about how it would look to others if he was associated with the wrong group. He'd rather die than be associated with this group. He'd rather die than see what God had done for these people. He was unwilling to do what was necessary even though he was at fault for putting people's lives at risk. He would rather die than see others live. This man did not care about others. His heart was hardened. Now it seems like I've probably been pretty rough on, Jude, on Jonah. And you're right, I have been. But no harder than I am on myself because I see myself here. I see so many people who believe in God and who know God and have experienced God. Because what I see is he didn't recognize the same grace, the same freedom, the same liberty that had been provided him. 
he didn't recognize that it was available to the Ninevites. Generations of hatred and aggression had skewed his view and has hardened his heart. Jonah's passion was self-serving. He was passionate about God as long as it got him what he wanted. He was passionate about God as long as it put him in, and the Israelites in a great place. But when it came to those other people, he didn't want that. The same grace we have been given today is also available to the person we despise. That same freedom we can experience is for anyone who is bondage, is in bondage. The same liberty you have to go to God to seek him is the same liberty offered to everyone. But I'm afraid we are missing that today. I'm afraid that we're not providing that to other people. I'm afraid we're not offering that and telling people that they can have that. As Christians, we see others and look, why, they sh why should they be punished? Or we, we look at them and go, they should be punished and not forgiven. As Christians, we are looking at others going, they deserve what has happened to them. We see those that are broken, and instead of helping to mend, we continue to tear down. We see those who have been through the worst, and maybe by their own decisions, and we go, well, those are the consequences. And I'm all about consequences, ask my kids. My kids will tell you, dad is all about consequences. If you run into a brick wall and it hurts, well, that's what's gonna happen. That's just the way it is. But there's grace. So once you've been hurt, let me hold you. Now, I probably don't offer as much grace to my kids as God does to us. I'm still learning. I've not reached God status, and I never will. We decide there is no hope and condemn instead of showing them there is hope. We are guilty of that. And if they do change, we stand back and wait to see how long it will last and even get angry at their triumphs. People change lives. We stand back. I've been guilty of it and go, eh, maybe it'll last, maybe it won't. I don't know, but we'll see. We'll see if they're sincere. We stand in a time where there are people dealing with generations of hurt for various reasons. All you have to do is look out there. There are groups of people who are hurting not just this generation, but it has been sent to them from generation and previous generation and previous generation for decades and decades and generations and centuries even. I'm unable to, I am unable to understand the pain because I have not experienced that. I'm unable to understand it because my family has not suffered in that way. I can't go back generations and see where we've been hurt or wronged. But I, knew that, I do know that just because I didn't see it or experience it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But what I am personally afraid of is what I'm personally afraid of, something that I am terrified of, is that what might be happening to me, the emotions, the feelings that I have, maybe the anger that might build up, the pushing people away, the not caring, the making them the enemy, that I may be the first generation in my family to allow that to happen. That I will be the first in my line to create animosity and anger and fear and hatred and bias instead of being the one to continue on the line of love and grace and hope. So I can decide if where I fit is this, but careful, we have to be careful. We don't want to condemn one another for their sins or for our sins while we set in the grace of God. Jonah was setting in the grace of God. God had seen him become angry. God had pulled him back. God had helped put him on the right path. God had saved him. God was pushing and directing and, and prodding him with grace. And yet at the same time, he wasn't realizing that that same grace was afforded to the Ninevites. So God may be asking, what right do you have to be angry when you see others? What right do you have to expect God to provide for us, but not others? Christians tend to be known for what we are against. That's what we've been known for. That's what we're becoming known for, what we're against. It's time we become more known for what we are for, what we believe. So I will ask you, what are you for? 
I'll end with this verse. See, Jonah didn't have the opportunity to have this experience in front of him like what we have had. Jonah didn't have the experience that God has given us. So I will end with this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Our Heavenly Father, God, you see our hearts and our minds. God, you see the struggles and the pressures all around us. God, you see what tugs at us and pulls at us. So God, I ask that you show us your grace and allow us to extend that grace. Give us the strength and the wisdom to reach out to others, to know who they are, God, to know the people next door and across the street and in the next city that they can have the same grace, freedom, and liberty that we have been provided. God, don't let us be Jonah who is so angry that we cannot see you at work. Don't let us be that person that becomes so trivialized, so into ourselves that we cannot see you and what you have provided for us is for all. God, I just ask that you see, that you show, and that you lead us in your will. In your name, amen. Thank you. Have a blessed night. I hope I've said something that has either encouraged or pushed you toward the next step in life. God bless.